Semper VB here with you for the next hour talking about professional wrestling, which is something we do every single day here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. Tune in, iHeart, American Forces Radio, SportsByline.com, all of our over-the-air affiliates, podcast, or maybe you're watching on video through Twitch or YouTube. However you're joining us today, just like to say thank you. Hopefully wherever you are, it's sunny outside. If not, hopefully it's sunny inside your mind. A hot, sunny day here on my portion of Delmarva. No Brian Alvarez because it's Friday. So joining me today is Filthy Tom Lawler. And as always, we have a lot to talk about. And uh, I got to see how Filthy is going to book the uh, future run of Shane McMahon in AEW. But before we get to that, I got to bring him in right now because the passing of Taylor Tooley at the age of 56 years old, UFC 1's very first fight, Tom. Yes, the very first fighter to step foot in the octagon. Bill that six foot two, four hundred twenty pounds, hailing from Hawaii. In his pre-fight interview, this fighter who had made his way to Japan after a troubled youth, he made his way to Japan as a sumo wrestler. He let us know that despite his size. His strongest muscle was his heart, and that was going to carry him to be the champion of the very first UFC. Unfortunately, he faced one of the consensus biggest pricks in combat sports history, Gerard Gordo. And as he rushed forward, Gordo avoided then, landed some punches, Thule fell, and Gerard Saka kicked him in the face, sent his tooth into the crowd, and the fight was stopped. But it's a sad, sad day for me. One of my heroes, I can say this, one of my heroes, one of the very first men, a pioneer of mixed martial arts, is gone. Taylor Tooley, Taylor Willey, RIP. We're going to get into more of his career later on. Lived a very interesting life, but as I mentioned, got a lot to get into today. WWE reportedly inking a deal with the city of Indianapolis and the state of Indiana that's going to be very lucrative. SmackDown tonight and AEW Dynamite's Rating Craters. We'll be back, Wrestling Observer Live. The show, Mike Zemper, BB, and Filthy Tom Lawler here with you. We do this show right here for an hour at a time every single day, but if you want us 24-7, you can try to find us on Twitter slash X. I am at Semper VV. Tom is at Filthy Tom Lawler. The website is at WONF4W, and the broadcaster is at Sports Byline USA. Jim Valley is here with you on Saturday, starting at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. And on Sunday, Andrew Zarian joins you beginning at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. I'd also love it if you made the Wrestling News part of your day. You can find it wherever you download your favorite podcast or head on over to WrestlingNews.com or at Wrestling News AV on X and Facebook every single day of the year. It's everything you need to know to get your day started, get you up to date, or get you to your favorite long-form review pod like Wrestling Observer Radio. Dave Meltzer will be back for subscribers later on this evening with Garrett Gonzalez for Wrestling Observer Radio, talking all about this week's newsletter and everything taking place around the world of wrestling. And, of course, about Taylor Tully as well, too. And we're going to get back into him a little bit later on in the show. But a big deal for WWE. This was first reported yesterday by WrestleVotes that the city of Indianapolis is on the verge of signing a major multi-event deal with WWE that would bring a slew of major events into the state, including WrestleMania and the Royal Rumble. Indianapolis Business Journal confirmed that WWE is close to an agreement, saying it is a seven-year agreement that will benefit the entire state. Initially yesterday, it was rumored to be a five-year deal. Regardless of the length, the city of Indianapolis is expected to receive multiple PLEs. I feel confident in saying from some things that I heard, that the deal will include at least one WrestleMania, Royal Rumble, SummerSlam, and Survivor Series over those years, and of course the television and NXT events that surround those weekends. IBJ is also reporting that WrestleMania and next year's Royal Rumble, which would take place on February 1st, uh, will, will take place on February 1st, 
IBJ also reports the deal calls for house shows at Gainbridge Fieldhouse in Indianapolis, as well as markets like Fort Wayne and Evansville, which will host Monday Night Raw this coming September 30th. Financial terms of the deal have not been disclosed, but IBJ sources said that the state's sports tourism agency, the Indiana Sport Corporation, is tapping into the state's $5 million tourism bid fund to sweeten the deal. That fund was created in 2022 and received its first funding allocation as part of the state's 2023 to 25 biannual budget as part of an effort to lure more big events, including WrestleMania, into the state. The announcement of the deal is expected to occur this coming Monday morning in Indianapolis, where Monday Night Raw will be held. It is a big commitment from the state of Indiana to WWE, no doubt. It is going to be a big windfall for WWE and TKO. It guarantees large-scale events every single year for the state of Indiana. And very interestingly, it's great to have a Rolodex. It is great to keep connections because Patrick Talty has served as the president of the Indiana Sport Corporation since July of 2022, and that corporation's mission is to lure and organize events in the state like he did with the 2021 NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament in Indianapolis. Past employment of Telti saw him work as the general manager of U.S. Bank Stadium in Minneapolis, during which a Super Bowl and Final Four were held, as well as working for WWE as the senior vice president of live events. So, a very obviously the state of Indiana looking to drum up business, Tom, looking to bring events into the state. They had a nice direct connection with Patrick Talty here with the uh, who serves as the president of the Indiana Sport Corporation and this is obviously great for fans in that area. I would I would say if you are east of Kansas City and north of like Dallas, like it is a pretty easy location to get into Indianapolis is they have not had a WrestleMania since way back at WrestleMania 7, which was at the Hoosier Dome back then, the uh, which should have been Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan, but ended up not working itself out to be that way. But uh, a big deal and probably a huge amount of money for WWE. Yeah, there are no lack of wrestling fans in that area of the United States. You would be drawing on, you mentioned Kansas, right? You'd be drawing on fans from Illinois and Chicago. Easy no shot doubt, that would make the drive over. Straight down. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know how far away Cleveland and those cities are, but I mean, you could probably realistically stretch as far as there to get people to drive over, if not further. You're going to be making the drive, Mike? How far away from Del Marva <laughs> is Indianapolis? <laughs> That that is a that is a long drive. It takes me God, I'm trying to think of how long it takes me to get what took me to get to Roanoke to go see Boogie Woogie Man Jimmy Valiant. That was like a, a four and a half hour trip. It may have been even a little bit longer than that, down deep into uh past Roanoke down there. So it would take me a while, but it would also be a relatively straight drive. And I think that's the biggest benefit is if you're in Toronto or Detroit or Chicago or Kansas City or Louisville, uh, Pittsburgh, you know, you can really, it, it's very easy to get into there. So it's a hell of a commitment. I mean, seven years is a, a hell of a commitment to make. But, you know, this is where WWE is going. A lot of people were wondering, okay, you made all these TV deals. What are they doing? Well, we saw it at WrestleMania with the, all of the new advertising that they were getting in, using the mat, putting stuff around the ring. And they haven't really utilized that since WrestleMania. But this is another way they're doing it by completely changing the way that they're dealing with these cities. Yeah, and I am kind of, I guess, surprised to see this as a WWE deal, not a TKO deal, because you would think that Indianapolis would also love to have a UFC event. There's also no lack of fight fans in that area of the Midwest. There's no lack of wrestling fans, amateur wrestling fans, in those areas. Hallelujah so, to that. I mean, you could throw in a fight night, 
you could have a big time UFC pay per view event take place in the arena in Indianapolis. Uh, I'm I'm surprised that it wasn't you know a dual situation, a dual setup, synergy. <laughs> and hey, and maybe there's a reason it's not. Maybe they got another separate deal in their holster that they're going to want to pull out a little bit later on. Yeah. You know, you just you mentioned something that will make me jump off course here. So sorry, everybody. But NIL deals are obviously affecting men's college basketball and, of course, men's college football. Could we possibly see the influx of money into amateur wrestling by those people that are big fans of amateur wrestling and who help fund programs like Penn State, Iowa, Minnesota, and so many others. Could we see a situation where somebody could get involved in, in wrestling in that way, maybe because they're tired of seeing Penn State and Kale Sanderson win every year? Could we see that? And could we then possibly, would that open the door in your opinion for the possibility of a TKO to get involved in, in in the NCAA in that way? UFC Fight Pass, I know it's not like, you know, directly dealing with them, I don't think, but UFC Fight Pass has shown NCAA wrestling over the past few years. They have dipped their foot into that a little bit. The WWE has no shortage of amateur wrestlers under NIL deals as well, from what I understand. Uh, I think true. Mason Paris, perhaps, yes. AJ Ferrari, uh, I don't I'm know sure if that one's still active anymore. <laughs> well, I'm sure there's a number of others uh, that I'm missing out on. And what you're talking about, Mike, uh, unfortunately, the first thought I had in my head when you started talking like that was a situation like we had with Foxcatcher. You know, you start getting people with a ton of money, some weirdos trying to take control of amateur wrestling. Once again, we've seen how that turned out and uh, it didn't turn out too well. No, no weirdos, no 69 gods. We got a lot more to get into when we get back Wrestling Observer Live. Amber VB and Filthy Tom Lawler here with you, Wrestling Observer Live. Okay, it, this was not going to be a story this high up on the roster, but then the number came in. So we're going to do the television ratings, and we're going to take them in order. Tuesdays, NXT was up slightly overall, drew 724,000 people, up 6,000 viewers. But in the 18- to 49-year-old department, the show really rebounded, drawing a .26, up from a .22. That was the best the show had done since last November. The .26 this week equaled about 341,000 viewers, up 60,000. NXT was going head-to-head -head with Game 5 of the NHL Stanley Cup Final, which topped all of TV with a 1.13 rating in 18 to 49 and averaged 4.15 million viewers. That moves us to Wednesday, where AEW Dynamite was down a quarter of its audience from the week before, averaging 502,000 viewers. It is the lowest the show has ever drawn on Wednesday night, the lowest the show has ever drawn without competition from the NBA. And even if you include that competition, it is the third lowest total in the history of the show. Up on the front page of the site, Paul Fontaine notes that Dynamite finished third on cable with a .16 rating in the 18-49 year old demo, down 30.4% from last week, the lowest number in the history of the show. What was on at the time? Well, there was the College World Series on ESPN, the the U.S. Olympic Trials on NBC, and I'm going to give Filthy what he wants because I got to be honest, I was watching Kendrick Lamar's Ken and Friends Pop Out Concert on Amazon Prime. Filthy, uh, were, were you getting it down uh, with, with Tyler, the creator, and the tribute to Nip and Mustard Set and, and Ken popping out there with all of his friends there in Inglewood, California? Mike, I was praying. Praying? You were going to give me what I wanted, and it wasn't the Kendrick Lamar five straight diss tracks in a row. Oh, there were plenty more than that. It was, he, he just did not like us five times. Where are the WNBA ratings? The, the WNBA ratings, you think? I'm, I'm telling you. 
I'm telling you, that's what's been causing havoc for weeks and weeks. And I got a question about these NXT ratings as well. Yes. The demo went up with no sexy up. red. Maybe everybody heard and they believe in Joe Hendry. Uh, maybe everybody saw the video like a year ago and, uh, you know, maybe they hey, want to see no mo. I think they want to see Trick Williams. You know, that's part of it. You know, for anything else the show has, when Sexy Red, you know, those segments, as Brian likes to point out, were not the highest rated on that show. It was the stuff with Trick Williams and, you know, the 25-man battle royal. I'm sure there were people that were tuning in to see who would come over from TNA, who would those people be. And if anybody out there didn't see, one of which, uh, one of them was Joe Henry, the other one was Kazarian, who was there in that match. So... I don't know. I, you know, it was down a couple of weeks ago, and I was surprised by that. You know, last week, it, again, last week it was down, like, you know, 50,000 people. And it was like, well, what's the reason for this? You know, after a good show the week prior, but just one of those things. But obviously, whatever they got going on, it worked for the demo. I would love to see a breakdown, please, in The Observer, Dave Meltzer. Give me a breakdown of the ratings draws between Sexy Red and Ollie J, the GOAT. Oh, my God. So, do you have any thoughts on... How long Dynamite? before they bring in the Hawk Tua girl, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, we're, we're going to get to somebody that AEW could bring in and make a big difference in the ratings, but do you have any thoughts about the number being what it was on Wednesday night being only 502,000? And again, this was reported by Programming Insider, I believe was the source of this, so it is a legitimate source. It's not one of somebody getting fed information by WWE or something like that. And WrestleNomics Brandon Thurston went and backed that up, and it's on the front page of the site as well, too. So this looks like it's the number here. And the crazy part is, is the stuff, Destination Unknown, I believe it was on Nat Geo or whatever it was, like the competition did not seem stiff enough to cause this type of pain in both categories. Well, if I want to give AEW the benefit of the doubt, it is summer, right? So absolutely federal holiday. I, June I mean, that's, that's always going to be, uh, you know, a hit but to it the was ratings summer last a little bit there. Too. Forbidden door. Doesn't this happen every forbidden door season? Everybody goes, Oh, the ratings are going to be terrible. The pay-per-view is not going to draw. And then the ratings suffer and the pay-per-view does just fine. So we'll see how the pay-per-view does this weekend. If that pay-per-view is down a large number, that's when I would really, really be concerned. Although, you know, tell everybody talks about television being down, but if you're if you're Warner Brothers or WBD and you are in what seems to be dire straits in a lot of ways when it comes to how the analysts and pundits look at your future as a as a company then Only you've got to be worried plus is worse than you <laughs> hey, they got problems over there <laughs> yeah and things don't sound too optimistic so um that that's another issue in and of itself i would imagine they're in this tv rights deal um you know era where they're trying to get a, a raise i guess to also then raise the profile of the company but i just <sighs> The angle, the angle up top, I just isn't working for the people. You know, I hate to say it, but I think people do not want to see a battle for control between Tony Khan and the Young Bucks up on top. I think it's too much WWE from, you know, 2005 until 2021. And I think that is what AEW did such a good job of at first was not being that company was not being what people were sick of in the wwe and while they've still obviously maintained great wrestling up and down throughout the card i think that you know an angle like that isn't doing a, a great service to them but doesn't an angle like that also need clearly defined lines that you need to color in you know jack perry gets lit on fire he comes back and makes the pin 
Tony Khan is afraid for his life and, and these things happen to him. I, it just there's so much that's so all over the place, whereas at least with WWE, there was the one unifying factor of the McMahon family. And they were the ones that you hated and everybody else was fighting or dealing with that. Where here, it just seems like a free for all a lot when it comes to that storyline. And I also think as well, too. Again, things need time to develop and breathe and all that sort of stuff. I don't think people are as big on the learning tree as Brian is in, in that angle. Obviously, as you mentioned, it's Forbidden Door season. And for a lot of wrestling fans, they just don't care about the fact that we're getting a bunch of New Japan and CMLL and Stardom wrestlers in, even if there are some of us who like this sort of stuff. Well, you know, Mike, if you I take think a look, MJF and Heshichero, I think, is a great example. They're going to be people and have been people already saying, why are you even doing this match? Do the Roosh match. OK, fine. That's cool. But why are you doing Heshichero with MJF? As good as Heshichero is as a wrestler, why would you do that match? At least he's been around. I mean, there's a whole number of guys. Where's Naito been? He's got a title match. Right. Yeah, One of yeah. the issues now that you find with Forbidden Door is AEW has a lot of the old New Japan guys on their roster, and there isn't a clear definition between the two of them. Rocky Romero works. He works for both companies. You know what I mean? So and I think, I think that and, and you have you, well, you have a lot of crossover throughout the year as well. Well, and so, the thing is, I think for a lot of New Japan fans, too, like you've taken a lot of people and we got the young guys who are probably going to come over if they come over at all and lose because that's part of their story. And it's I think is there can you see because, again, I, I don't know, maybe I'm too cynical about it, but I can see a New Japan fan, at least well, some feeling in that feels feeling that way. We can see all these guys anyway. And hell, they're on half of our cards. Mike, what, what is the top faction, the top heel faction in New Japan? Can you answer that? for me house what of is torture it? by default house of torture house of torture bullet yes. club war dogs right it's where have they though. been well it doesn't matter neither one of but them's been on they? aw yeah. forbidden door television all of a sudden we're gonna have gabe kid and finley i think on rampage but the pay-per-views this sunday you know what i mean they should have been featured more because they are a new japan act Who the bullet English? club is a new japan act we don't even have bullet club gold anymore it's now the bang bang gang the bullet club is a new japan act they have been nowhere to be found we don't have Cobb and oka coming over as united empire there's a number of guys just teaming with other people tmdk was teaming with leo rush and rocky you've yeah. got zach teaming with i don't even know who he was teaming with but he was in an all-star match he, you could have had four guys from tmdk five six you could have had all However many there are, probably guys that are not even, even in New Japan. You could have had them on collision and had some sort of separation, but it hasn't happened. So. Gabe Kidd cuts a pretty good promo. Clark Connors kind of knows what to do in front of the camera when it's put there. Clark yeah. Connors got over big time. If you remember a few years ago in Forbidden Door in that four-way, he was spearing people out of their boots, speared Miro right out of his boots, if I remember correctly. And in theory, David Finley is the top foreigner in the top heel group in that promotion. And you don't hear about him much over there, let alone hearing about him much here. I don't know. I don't know. I shrug my shoulders. Usually, no matter what, this pay-per-view is going to draw because all AEW pay-per-views draw. Now, Forbidden Door draws a little less than most of them, but I'm really interested to see once the final tallies come out and Dave Meltzer and Brandon Thurston and all the folks report them, what this number ends up really being. We'll be back, Wrestling Observer Live. So, I was in Mike Tipper Vivi, Filthy Tom Lawler, Lawler here, Wrestling Observer Live. Papoose playing us in. <laughs> Filthy. AEW, obviously, going through a, a time right now when it comes to its its ratings when Dynamite, but the answer is right there. You know, I'm just going to read this right off the front page of WrestlingObserver.com. Amid rumors that surfaced this week that former WWE employee and occasional wrestler Shane McMahon had thrown out feelers about coming to AEW that is apparently news to owner of the company, to the owner of the company, 
In a quote given to Dave Meltzer for the newsletter this week, AEW head Tony Khan said, I've never met him or talked to him in my life. On an episode of Grilling JR this week, Conrad Thompson and Jim Ross followed up on a conversation they had had the previous week about the possibility of McMahon, son of Vince McMahon, coming to AEW. Thompson said a mutual friend of he and Ross texted him out of the blue to say the idea was not as crazy as some might think and that McMahon had reached out to AEW wrestling to hypothetically discuss the idea. Meltzer reported that some higher-ups on both sides of the food chain have assumed to mean both WWE and AEW said they've heard nothing close to the rumors, while others he spoke with said they have heard nothing other than what Thompson said. Meltzer said another person mentioned to him in a conversation about McMahon and an ex-WWE wrestler currently in AEW. McMahon and the wrestler were chatting about the attention it would get if he came out on Dynamite. However, the conversation was not a pitch for that to happen. Obviously, the last time that Shane O'Mac was in a wrestling ring, it was that magical moment at WrestleMania 39 where he came out for a match with The Miz and tore his quad <laughs> Taurus Quad and Snoop Dogg had to save the day for everybody involved. It would get attention now, wouldn't it? What an all-time great wrestling moment. It I may was. have to go back and watch that after this show. Anything that could have gone wrong went wrong. Except except for the fact that the, the one guy who was probably... The highest out of anybody in the whole arena was able to pull it together and salvage something out of that segment. Just absolutely tremendous. Shane McMahon, for better or worse, will always be known as son of Vince McMahon. It doesn't matter if he buys WCW. It doesn't matter if he survives a crash into the Hudson or Potomac River or whatever it was and make it out alive. What was a helicopter crash he went Something down like in? That. Yeah. And they interview him. Son of Vince McMahon. What about all the things Shane McMahon's done? He's been a champion. He was the owner of WCW. Trained in Muay Thai. One of the, uh, what was it? The uh, green, what was his team? The, <laughs> the, the, green, the, the Mean the, Street the, Posse. Mean One Street of the Posse mean street, the leader of the Mean Street Posse. I don't know what I was even going to call them. Um, <laughs> I, I selfishly, <laughs> hell. Did, did he not try what to if, video what if we find China? Out, hey, he did. What if we find out that Shane McMahon's been the one pulling the strings for the Young Bucks? Maybe that well, could be the thing that turns it around. I it would for the young bucks or he needs Okada. Well, look, he needs you know Tony needs somebody to step in. I mean, there are all, there are all sorts of ways he could work into that storyline, and of course the storyline with Christian, where he comes up to him and goes, "You know, you've really never had a father." What was this whole story. segment a setup for that? No, but you know it's right. <laughs> <laughs> this is ridiculous i don't think it will I, you know what i take it back i don't know how rid it's ridiculous but to say it'll never happen why there's no reason to say it'll never happen i will assume that shane mcmahon will outlive his father and if aew was around 20 more years i'm sure in the next two decades maybe vince mcmahon makes a cameo walking through or something like that but i think you would just be begging for it in multiple ways if you were to bring Shane McMahon in uh, to be a character. This is not WWE bringing in well, what you get, you can't, Eric listen, Bischoff, I don't think. He's a character no matter what if you That's bring him true. in or not. So That's true. Absolutely entertaining guy, but uh, I don't know. No, <laughs> well, Honestly, if you were going purely based on entertainment factor, what are the, what are the best ever? Well, look, he, he <laughs> he's he entertaining. Would, That's no, there's he, no he doubt. Absolutely, yes. Tried, tries as hard as he can. There's no doubt about that either. He is, he is the best in the world. If you remember, he won the tournament to crown the best wrestler in the world that was put on by WWE. Oh my, WWE SmackDown is tonight and. Rosemont, Illinois. 
Talk about a place that's perfectly convenient if you're coming from O'Hare Airport, just right there, uh, All-State Arena. Money in the Bank qualifying triple threat matches. Kevin Owens against Andrade against Grayson Waller. There's another one with Randy Orton against Tamatanga against Carmelo Hayes. A segment between L.A. Knight and United States champion Logan Paul has been added. Universal champion Cody Rhodes responds to the bloodline. The name Caesar Sokoa has now been trademarked by WWE. I like that one, actually. That's pretty good. And CM Punk is in Chicago to give an update on his comeback. Drew McIntyre quit WWE on Monday night, walked out of there before the Wyatt family, uh, the Wyatt Six, laid waste to everybody, including Chad Gable, who is now out of the Money in the Bank qualifier coming up on Raw on Monday in Indianapolis. Tom, you think Drew McIntyre shows up and spoils CM Punk's good time in his hometown? He should. It's pretty quick to quit and then show back up on the next show, however. You would think. uh, But I don't really see any other way that you do this. Do you look fighters heal faster than normal men? It's been exactly six months since he went out with this injury. It is well within the frame for somebody to recover from this between six and nine months. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that he is, but when you factor in his age and all that sort of stuff, it would be a surprise to me if he's actually ready to come back and, I know there's been some buzzing that he's not ready to come back yet, but could you see him actually, whether he's ready or not, just saying that he is ready to pop the crowd? And even if Drew is not there, that could play into a storyline of Drew injuring CM Punk, who really is not ready to come back yet? Yeah, and then takes him out for a longer period of time. And then that takes you to SummerSlam, right? You could also have somebody else take him out and set up a return program for him without Drew being the one to fight him right when he comes back. Although it has been reported that they're looking for, you know, Punk and Drew at SummerSlam. So, yeah, maybe tonight's the <clears throat> the false comeback for CM Punk. Maybe he lets us know he's ready. He's ready to get in the ring. Maybe, maybe as early as Raw on Monday, but he gets attacked and taken out at the Rosemont, in Rosemont. When are we going to see Gunther? We need Gunther involved in something, beating somebody up. Beating well, he has, a, he has a title match coming up at SummerSlam, whether we like it or not. As That's true. part of the conditions of winning the King of the Ring. And when are Not, they going to Germany? I guess that's going to be the heat up around that point when they go over there for, um, oh, heavens, I, f- I forget what the pay-per-view is, but then there, you got that event coming up as well, too. So maybe it's just out of sight, out of mind right now until they ready up at everything that they got going on for him coming up. Yeah, WWE Bash in Berlin. Bash in Berlin. Mm. August 31st. Hmm. Interesting time to have a pay-per-view in Germany after Gunther gets his title shot a few weeks earlier at SummerSlam. Is anything going to be going on on that continent at, around that time? Uh, yeah, I think a little thing called the Olympics will be taking place uh, a little bit prior to that, actually. They'll probably be finished by then. You weren't Is that what you were referring to? EW all in? Or, uh, no? Not with that show on the first around that time that as well yeah <laughs> mike yes <laughs> yeah i know fine. it's a wrestling show yeah but i hate to break it to you the olympics are a bigger deal than any any of the wrestling shows you said is there something big going on in europe around that time yeah the biggest event eurovision's is over not, bro. is not all in i'm sorry it's the olympics don't don't give me guff for saying that is there wrestling tom it's not like not like i said ks not like i said ksw or octagon mma were happening actually there is olympic wrestling which is back and the way it goddamn should be 
Yeah, so there's pardon, judo yeah. as well. There's yes. Greco-Roman wrestling. There's freestyle wrestling. There's women's freestyle wrestling. There's judo. There's taekwondo. A number of combat sports will be represented at the Olympics during that time frame in what is the biggest and most prestigious competition in our galaxy. Unfortunately, NXT's Gigi Dolan is going to miss some of the competition if she was involved in the competition She's actually all set up now perfectly to just watch everything at her leisure this summer as she is suffering from a reported torn ACL, according to Dave Meltzer. In this week's Wrestling Observer Newsletter, the 27-year-old Dolan has been out of action since March, and there is no timetable for her return. Dolan last wrestled on the March 12th edition of NXT, losing to Ariana Grace by disqualification. As a stipulation of Grace winning the match, she got to give Dolan a makeover, and then we saw how all that played itself out on TV over the next couple of weeks. NXT is going to be holding house shows this weekend, as is WWE. The WWE's Super Show Summer Tour is Saturday at Grossinger Motors Arena in Bloomington, Illinois, and then heads to Kalamazoo, Michigan at the Wings Event Center, not the Woo Wings Event Center. <laughs> NXT is tonight at the Venice Community Center in Venice, Florida, and on Saturday they'll be at the Inglewood Cal or the Inglewood, California, the Inglewood Neighborhood Center in Orlando. Did you ever stomp around Orlando there? You're a big star in Orlando, right? Hall of Famer? I am a uh, alumni of the University of Central Florida. So, yeah, I stomped around Orlando way too much. For 10 years, I stomped around that place. What'd you think? Were you happy to get out of there? What'd you think of Florida? At the time, you know, I'm a fan of it as well. I basically live in the same place, just in the desert. So I wow. traded one tourist haven for another here in Las <laughs> Vegas. My brother. A lot of transients, a lot of derelicts, a lot of scumbags. Both my kind of places. I was going to say, sounds like the perfect place. Indianapolis, you've spent some time there. Uh, I don't know if you'd call that a, a scumbag place, but Monday Night Raw is going to be there. Uh, what's your biggest and best moment in the city of Indianapolis? Do you have one? Yeah, it was actually where I defeated the Karate Man via Death Touch in Indianapolis during the COVID era at an AIW wrestling show. So, Guy has not recovered since. I don't even know where he's at right now. Mike Sempervivi, Filthy Tom Lawler. We'll be back to put a bow on this thing right after these messages. Wrestling Observer Live. The show, Mike Sempervivi, Filthy Tom Lawler here to put a bow on this thing. You know, Filthy Taylor Tui uh, ended up uh, only fighting that one fight that he had. And, uh, lived an interesting life, though, in that he was a mentor to Akabono. When Akabono, who later on got into professional wrestling and in mixed martial arts over in Japan... Uh, when he began in sumo, he became a mentor to him. And then after getting his teeth kicked out and his orbital bone fractured in that first UFC fight, he ends up going to become an actor and was actually on uh, CBS in the rehash of Hawaii Five-0 and Magnum P.I. had a recurring role on Hawaii Five-0. So uh, amazing. And interestingly enough, you know, it was part of the first lie of the UFC. You had to be killed. You had to be knocked unconscious. You had to say you quit. And the injury stoppage stopped that fight. First lie. Yeah. If anybody out there has the time, and you should make the time, you should check out a few things featuring Taylor Tooley. One, his pig roast scene in the tremendous movie Forgetting Sarah, Sarah Marshall. Marshall. <laughs> he plays backup for Jason Siegel in that movie. And also, I watched a Sure Dog interview with him and also a UFC One roundtable with a lot of the fighters from that time. And just to hear them talk about the unknown aspects, the chaos surrounding the early UFCs and MMA is great. And Taylor Tooley said some things in these interviews that I remember thinking myself, you know, I wanting to go out and be the best fighter in the world, not knowing what's going to happen. But having the heart and determination and just the desire to make something of yourself in that cage. And, uh, I, hey, I'm not too proud to say I watched these interviews and I cried. You know, seeing these guys go away. Art Jimerson's no longer here as of recently. Taylor Tooley. <sighs> I've never felt more mortal, Mike. 
You know what, my man? Art Davey said, if it wasn't for what Taylor Tui said before first UFC, it may have not have happened. Just an amazing, amazing story. Filthy, I thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you, Producer Daniel. Thank you, Producer John. And thank you, all of, our, all of you out there, for watching and listening. We shall talk to you again after a while. <laughs>